nous attaquons la troisième, nous débutons la troisième masterclass de la journée, euh, journée euh, qui s'inscrit dans le cadre de la Sophia AI Week qui a débuté hier avec le World Usability Day, on y reviendra avec Catherine, euh, et qui ce matin a permis de... Euh, d'écouter les usages de données territoriales appliquées au développement durable par la communauté d'agglomération Sophie Antipolis. Euh, ensuite, la deuxième masterclass a abordé le sujet de l'intégration d'un réseau de neurones sur le microcontrôleur des lunettes LCLC euh, et a noté la participation d'une doctorante de l'Université Côte d'Azur et qui fait un, un trait d'union tout à fait euh, pertinent et, et naturel entre justement les jeunes entreprises innovantes et l'Université Côte d'Azur. L'Université Côte d'Azur qui va présenter euh, la troisième masterclass, donc Monitoring Cyberbullying Through Message Classification and Social Network Analysis dans quelques instants et nous clôturerons la journée par une quatrième masterclass avec la société ARM avec du machine learning frameworks and tools. Il nous a semblé important de partager avec vous et en l'occurrence avec Catherine Bellino qui, outre son, son, son métier de, de consultante au sein de, de Dialogos, a, est aussi animatrice de la communauté UX et CIS de Télécom Valley avec lesquelles nous faisons souvent de l'interdisciplinarité avec la communauté d'Ataïa que j'ai le, le bonheur d'animer. Euh, avec, avec euh, Grégory et Magali. Et euh, hier, justement, euh, cette communauté euh, de UXC6 a organisé le World Usability Day. Euh, de, en fait, ça fait depuis 2005 euh, que ça se passe. Et il nous semblait important de faire le lien entre, justement, euh, le design euh, au sens concep conception, justement, et euh, le coding, c'est-à-dire ce qu'il peut y avoir euh, sous le capot et comment c'est important de replacer à chaque instant euh, ben, l'utilisateur et l'utilisatrice au centre des préoccupations. Donc, Catherine, c'est à toi pour cette introduction euh, à, à, à ce lien euh, qui, euh, il, est, il est probable, va résonner avec les travaux que euh, Serena et euh, Elena vont nous présenter euh, ensuite, dans lequel, euh, effectivement, euh, l'humain est complètement euh, au centre. Ok, donc je vais essayer de… Merci beaucoup, euh, Florence, et merci… Euh de nous accueillir justement en introduction de ces prestigieuses masterclass. C'est vraiment super ce, ce type de, de lien qu'on peut faire, c'est très important. Alors, je vais essayer de partager mon écran. Euh, et je vais me mettre en mode présentation. Alors, est-ce que vous voyez mon plein écran Ou, ou pas Est-ce que vous voyez ma présentation oui, on voit ta présentation, on voit, on voit aussi euh, les diapos. D'accord. Et là Voilà, parfait. Ok. Donc, je vais, je vais très rapidement vous, vous expliquer, ce, vous faire une petite introduction sur justement ce qu'est ce World Usability Day qu'on organise, comme la différence depuis 15 ans. Euh, et puis, euh, vous pourrez ensuite, je vous donnerai les liens, vous, vous pourrez, euh, pour ceux qui sont intéressés en savoir plus, euh, sur les, les conférences très intéressantes qui, euh, qui ont été présentées euh, hier et qui sont disponibles sur euh, YouTube. Et je vais vous faire une petite, euh, juste une petite euh, introduction rapide à ce que c'est justement l'expérience le, utilisateur et en quoi euh, ça peut être euh, important euh, dans, dans le domaine de l'intelligence artificielle. Donc, pour, euh, pour le contexte, donc, le World Disability Day, euh, c'était euh, toute la journée, enfin l'après-midi d'hier, en effet, en ouverture de cette semaine sur l'intelligence euh, artificielle. Et c'est donc une manifestation euh, mondiale qui, euh, qui réunit chaque année euh, dans le monde entier des initiatives euh, autour de l'UX euh, et de l'utilisabilité, hein, qui est vraiment une notion clé dans mon métier. Euh, donc, le degré selon lequel les, la, la capacité des technologies à être utilisées de manière efficace, efficiente et satisfaisante par, par les utilisateurs. Donc, on est vraiment dans, dans une démarche qui est centrée sur l'humain et on, 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 donc on, est, on fait beaucoup de, de sensibilisation, de, de, de travaux, de communication, de partage, d'échange, justement, autour de ces questions-là 
qui sont de plus en plus importantes à l'heure de, de d'une transformation digitale massive et de l'imprégnation de notre univers par, par le numérique. Voilà, donc c'est un, un événement qui est organisé par la communauté UX et X de Télécom Valley, elle-même animée par l'association la, la, Usage qui a fondé à l'origine euh, ce, cet événement à Sofia. Alors juste une petite euh, une image finalement qui, euh, qui euh, va servir de, de support à une très très rapide introduction à ce qu'est ce qu la, la user experience, l'UX pour les, pour les intimes. Donc euh, en fait, euh, cette, cette image est assez représentative parce qu'elle montre euh, que bah, un design, un, un objet, un produit, un service peut être conçu d'une certaine manière et en réalité dans la pratique, euh, il va être utilisé d'une autre manière, d'une certaine manière, d'une manière singulière par euh, ses utilisateurs. Dans ce cas de figure, donc on a un chemin euh, relativement régulier, euh, bien goudronné, etc., qui a été pensé euh, par ce qu'on peut appeler des designers, en l'occurrence. Euh, et voilà comment se sont appropriés euh, ce chemin, les, les, comment les utilisateurs, finalement, se sont appropriés ce chemin. Donc, ils ont, ils ont tracé des, des chemins alternatifs euh, dans l'herbe, euh, plusieurs chemins alternatifs dans l'herbe, et on peut s'interroger sur euh, bah, la, pourquoi finalement euh, euh, ils n'ont pas choisi le chemin principal, euh, et il peut y avoir plein de raisons à cela, il peut, peut y avoir euh, une question du temps, bah, en fait ils, étaient, ils voulaient un chemin plus rapide qui leur permettait de raccourcir leur trajet, ou bien il peut y avoir des notions euh, plus... Euh, euh, émotionnel comme le fait que euh, bah, peut-être ils préfèrent marcher dans l'herbe euh, que dans, sur le goudron ou encore euh, euh, des notions plus euh, de personnalité, euh, peut-être que euh, c'est une question d'anticonformisme par exemple, bref il peut y avoir plein de raisons à cela et on ne peut pas le savoir a priori en voyant juste le résultat, donc euh, la user experience c'est quoi C'est une discipline qui vise à comprendre pour qui on conçoit nos, les produits et les solutions. Et donc, pour les comprendre, pour comprendre nos utilisateurs, on va aller à leur rencontre, on va les observer, on va les interroger, on va aussi concevoir avec eux des solutions, et puis on va tester ces solutions jusqu'à ce qu'on on soit à peu près assuré d'avoir quelque chose qui, euh, qui correspond vraiment euh, au profil, euh, aux besoins et au contexte d'usage des utilisateurs. Donc euh, voilà, ça s'exprime bien la différence finalement hein, entre ce qu'on appelle l'UX et le, le design. Le design doit s'alimenter de cette connaissance sur, euh, sur l'humain, sur l'utilisateur, pour pouvoir produire des solutions qui sont utilisées. Donc le but en fait, c'est vraiment qu'on arrive à des solutions utilisées et utilisées de la manière la plus efficiente possible. Donc, on peut avoir des superbes idées technologiques et, et Dieu sait si dans le domaine de l'intelligence artificielle, il y a des recherches passionnantes et des, 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 des innovations incroyables. Euh, mais si on n'a pas ce focus-là, ce regard-là euh, sur les usages et sur les utilisateurs, on risque de passer complètement à côté de la plaque et d'avoir au final des technologies extrêmement intelligentes, c'est le cas de le dire, euh, qui ne seront peut-être jamais euh, utilisées en tout cas pas euh, aux fins qu'on souhaitait. Donc ça peut, bien sûr, euh, c'est très dommage du point de vue de l'utilisation, ça peut avoir aussi euh, des conséquences financières euh, redoutables. Voilà, et quand on parle d'intelligence art, euh, artificielle, ben, on parle de sujets justement qui sont très euh, sensibles aussi en termes d'adoption, d'appropriation, de, de, de compréhension. On parle de questions euh, autour du lang langage notamment. Euh, euh, bon, là, vous allez... Euh, euh, certainement euh, évoquer les questions des réseaux sociaux, etc. Tout ça, ce sont vraiment des questions profondément humaines et qui nécessitent bien sûr de, de comprendre comment euh, l'humain fonctionne et comment il peut s'approprier euh, ces technologies. Donc voilà un petit peu euh, une petite euh, introduction sur, sur euh, l'UX. Et euh, donc euh, vous pourrez, euh, comme je vous le disais, retrouver... Euh, tous les, tous les sujets des, des, des interventions qui ont été présentées hier. Euh, donc ça, c'est le programme. Vous pouvez retrouver ça euh, sur la chaîne YouTube de Télécom Valley. Euh, donc tout a été euh, enregistré. Et, euh, et en tout cas, je vous souhaite euh, une excellente masterclass et une excellente euh, fin de journée. Encore une fois, je vous remercie euh, beaucoup 
de nous avoir invité euh, pour, pour introduire euh, cette, euh, cette masterclass. Voilà. Merci. Merci beaucoup, euh, merci beaucoup euh, Catherine pour, euh, pour, cette, pour cette introduction. Nous l'avons faite effectivement euh, en français euh, parce que euh, hier la, 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 comment, la, le World Usability Day euh, s'est déroulé en français. Now let's switch in English with uh, uh, Elena Cabrio and Serena Villata for uh, the third masterclass. Uh, Um, the, the focus of, the sub, uh, of this subject is monitoring cyberbullying through message classification and social network analysis. Uh, Elena and Serena, the place is yours. Thanks a lot, Florence. So I will share my screen. Okay, I hope you see you can see my screen. Yes. Great. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to this uh, masterclass on monitoring cyberbullying through. Uh, wait, I'm just uh, I just have to make it because uh, otherwise I have the. Okay, better. Okay. Uh, so welcome everybody to this masterclass on monitoring cyberbullying through message classification and social network analysis. So uh, who we are? So we are two researchers uh, at the, the Université Côte d'Azur uh, and CNRS. We are part of the I3S uh, laboratory uh, in uh, Sofia Antipolis, which is a computer science laboratory. Uh, and uh, actually we started working Uh, on uh, um, hate speech detection and cyberbullying detection uh, almost uh, three years ago uh, with the CRIP project. So uh, what's the outline of this masterclass? Well, I will start by introducing you what's the problem in uh, detecting hate speech, why we need to detect hate speech online. Uh, then I will move uh, to uh, a short description of some of the available data sets the state-of-the-art methods uh, that, that, that are available. Uh, I, will, uh, I will briefly uh, discuss the results that are obtained thus far on uh, this uh, topic. And I will conclude with uh, some open challenges in this area. And then I will leave the, the, the place to, to Elena, who will introduce uh, the CRIP project on which we worked on uh, since uh, 2017. Uh, and uh, the target of this project was uh, uh, actually uh, cyberbullying detection. So Elena will uh, present you the, method the methodology we uh, adopted, uh, the results we obtained, uh, how we tackled some challenges like uh, multilinguality and uh, images, and then uh, she will also show you some demos uh, about the CRIP project. So, Now we start with the first part of this masterclass uh, on hate speech detection. So the first uh, question we should ask ourselves is why do we need to study hate speech uh, automatic detection? Uh, well, actually there is, a, there, is an act, there is a need which has been also uh, made clear uh, in uh, European Com Com Commission uh, directives. And so the fact that actually there is a, um, an increase of uh, hate speech, uh, in, in particular in uh, online social networks and social media. And so also the European uh, Union Commission has uh, really uh, uh, proposed a number of uh, initiatives to, to, to tackle and uh, to, to fight actually this. So on one side, the Commission has proposed a number of programs Uh, uh, to, to fight hate speech, like the No Hate Speech Movement uh, by the Council of Europe. And then um, another strategy that has been uh, tackled uh, by the Commission has been uh, to, to propose new legislation uh, dealing with this issue. So in particular, in particular the Commission has pressured uh, big uh, social media uh, like Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Microsoft, to sign what is called an EU hate speech code, such that 
they uh, are they are required to review the the, the majority of uh, the valid notification of removal of illegal hate speech in less than 24 hours. So this is a strong constraint that actually uh, the European Commission put on uh, uh, social media uh, in order to improve the removal uh, of uh, this kind of context content on uh, uh, online. Uh, and uh, they actually they, they, they have been uh, pointed to, to Twitter as a, uh, that, the time for, as a bad case for, for this target. So what is the, the problem of hate speech? Uh, and that why we, we need to, to target it in an automatic way. So the, unfortunately, the problem of hate speech is nothing new in society. There, ha there, there have always been cases of hate speech uh, at school, uh, or, uh, in general, uh, in, uh, in many different uh, um, uh, times of, uh, of life, in particular for young people. So uh, in particular, the problem of hate speech uh, targets, uh, targets uh, teenagers and young people. Of course, this spread also all, uh, over all the other uh, age uh, categories, but still, this is the main target. Also because on social medias, they are those that are more active. And so this is why they become the, the, the preferred target in a way. So uh, this is nothing new. But the problem is that uh, with social media uh, and so social network platforms, uh, uh, forums, blog, and so on, uh, and also on, uh, on, on chat like uh, WhatsApp, uh, and meaning kind of online communication systems, actually, uh, these uh, hate crimes uh, has uh, taken really uh, um, another dimension. They have been uh, worldwide uh, issues. So, for instance, uh, I, uh, I point I, uh, I point out here two uh, unfortunately uh, well-known uh, cases that uh, we faced. So, suspects in uh, hate-related terror attacks and an extensive social media history of hate-related posts, uh, meaning that social media, in a way, uh, can uh, can. Um, contribute to the, the radicalization online uh, and also social media uh, play a direct role video footage uh, for, for the terror attack of Chris Church for instance which is one of the most famous ones also because after these the regulations become uh, important uh, on uh, on that side that was broadcast live on facebook so this really means that uh, there is a problem that has been that has taken um, a, a worldwide uh, dimension and we need to tackle it and of course doing that uh, from a pure manual way uh, is not feasible anymore because uh, it cannot scale. So actually uh, on these uh, communication uh, channels uh, like uh, these social media, uh, users express themselves freely and anonymously, okay? So the problem here, the problem of hate speech here is actually um, a big societal problem because it is at the, at the crossroad between two major issues for society. The first one is the fact that we should preserve the freedom of expression uh, online, okay? So that uh, people uh, are, are free to express themselves, to uh, put forward their own opinions uh, online. And that was also the, the, actually the aim at the very beginning of uh, social media platforms. On the other side, the abuse of this liberty uh, by spreading hate, uh, spe uh, hate, hate content and abusive content towards another group should be limited. So this is actually the crossroad on which we are when we talk about hate speech detection. So on the one side, we should uh, pay attention to the fact that uh, we should preserve the freedom of, of expression, expression. And on the other side, we should also uh, be uh, careful in detecting uh, abuses uh, of this uh, liberty. 
So for instance, if we take the American Bar Association uh, in, the, in the US, uh, this says that uh, hate speech actually is legal, okay, and protected by the First Amendment. Also, the, this hate speech uh, does not call directly for violence. So it means that uh, you, the US court, the Supreme Court has made it clear that governments may not restrict speech expressing ideas that offend. So uh, actually, social networks and social media, uh, they are all uh, very uh, knowledgeable about these, uh, these issues and how they could face it. So uh, they all consider hate speech, hate speech harmful uh, and uh, precise policies uh, targeting the removal of uh, such a kind of content has been uh, published online and they are actually uh, expressed and they are actually um, really employed by uh, social networks. So let's have a quick look at some of them just to understand what do, you, what do we mean and what do the, these different uh, platforms, platforms mean uh, for uh, aid speech. So for instance, if we take uh, Facebook regulation, uh, we say that uh, Facebook defines hate speech as a direct attack on people on the basis of legally protected aspects such as race, ethnicity, nationality of origin, religion, sexual orientation, caste, sex, gender or gender identity and disability or serious illness. Okay, so this is the kind of definition Facebook provides to, uh, to his users and they define the attack as violent or dehumanizing speech, harmful stereotypes, declarations of inferiority or incitement to exclusion or segregation. Okay, in case such a kind of context content is identified, okay, they expect people to clearly indicate their intention. Okay, if their intention was not uh, bad, here there are uh, three examples in particular. Okay. So uh, the first example is uh, the aim of raising awareness or informing other people. So this is an exception. In case uh, words or terms that might otherwise violate our standards are used in a self-referential manner or to reinforce a case, okay? And the third case, the third exception uh, is uh, uh, people expressing contempt in the context of breaking up a relationship. Okay, so there is a, there is a, a, a kind there are a kind of uh, uh, exceptions, a number of exceptions in cases that does not that, that do not fit these exceptions. Actually, if the intention of the user publishing such potentially harmful content is not clear then this content is uh, removed by the platform. And then we have YouTube, for instance. So they clearly state that YouTube hate speech is not allowed on YouTube, okay? Uh, they say we remove content promoting violence or hatred against individuals or groups based on any of the following attributes. And they identify age, caste, disability, ethnicity, and so on, okay? Here you have the full list of attributes that are used to identify um, messages uh, and videos uh, and, uh, and also metadata associated to videos uh, linking to uh, promote, trying to promote violence uh, or hate content. So uh, here there are the examples that are really proposed by YouTube of hate speech that are not al allowed on the platform. So for instance, uh, comments like, I'm glad this uh, violent event happened, they got what they deserved, uh, and then they are referring to persons with uh, some attributes. Uh, or persons uh, with attributes uh, noted above are dogs, or uh, persons uh, with some attributes are like animals, and so on. So these are really concrete examples that may be spotted on the platform and that are automatically removed from the platform. So, as you see, always for YouTube, what happens if the content violates this policy? Well, uh, the content will be removed and you will be, uh, you will be, uh, you will receive an email uh, telling that the, the, the content has been removed. So, uh, and then there is a kind of uh, uh, increasing uh, 
punishment of, of, the, of the community uh, towards those uh, that don't care about uh, these kind of, um, of alert, uh, alert message. So uh, if it is the first time uh, in uh, your uh, channel that uh, something is posted and uh, it doesn't uh, and it uh, it uh, it fits uh, in a way uh, violent co uh, content and so on then there is no penalty just a warning uh, otherwise uh, they issue a strike against the channel and the third time the channel is terminated okay so as you can see uh, the action uh, is uh, quite strong against this kind of content Twitter, uh, same for these uh, social media uh, platform. Uh, this is the hateful conduct policy of uh, uh, Twitter. Uh, if there is hateful conduct, uh, well, actually, you may not promote violence uh, against or directly attack or treat other people on the basis of, and again, here we, are, we see again the, the same attributes that Facebook, YouTube, and also other uh, platforms uh, use, so race, ethnicity, national origin, and so on. So uh, the, the, the idea, uh, the same holds also for imagery uh, and uh, display names, okay? So in general, Twitter, uh, when this kind of content is detected, also the, the, either the, uh, the, the username so, uh, is, is, is closed, okay, or uh, the, either the account is closed or uh, the content is uh, is banned. So this is what uh, this is what this is the kind of um, elements that are taken into account by Twitter. Okay, uh, so there is a, a accounts targeting an individual or group of people uh, with, uh, with taking action against them. Uh, violent threats, uh, wishing OP or calling for serious harm on a person or a group of people, uh, references to mass murder, violent events, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, in general, uh, also uh, hateful uh, imagery uh, and now videos uh, are also banned when they are detected uh, as uh, containing eight, uh, eight speech uh, or hateful content. So here there is a, a kind of a overview uh, of uh, how the, the different uh, the, the different actors or some of the, the different actors uh, on uh, on the web uh, are acting to to fight the the spread of hate speech online. Uh, well, uh, we have that uh, we have the EU code uh, code of conduct. We have the uh, ILGA, which is the International Minorities Association, uh, scientific papers, uh, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. <coughs> so we have that uh, in general, hate speech is to incite violence or hate. Uh, this is the kind of uh, definition which is uh, provided. Uh, this is not the case for Facebook, for instance. Hate speech is uh, to attack or diminish. So uh, this is the case for uh, YouTube, for, for, sorry, for Facebook uh, and Twitter. It is not the case for YouTube, for instance. Uh, hate speech has specific targets. All the actors agree actually on this point. And humor has a specific status. This is true only for Facebook, okay? And we will see in uh, the, next, uh, the next slides that actually humor um, and irony uh, and such a kind of, con uh, of content is really um, hard for us to, uh, to be classif correctly classified in an automatic way. So why we need hate speech detection, or better, why we need uh, hate speech detection, automatic hate speech detection? So actually, uh, that is uh, the, this, this, this problem, uh, is uh, is a problem which is uh, which is a, a concrete societal concern in speech, uh, and it is also widespread. And so there is really the need to uh, to fight this uh, this problem uh, in an efficient way. So uh, by automating the, the detection of its speech, uh, actually the spread of this content can be reduced. So why human verification is not enough? Because the problem mainly is that it cannot scale with the size of social networks nowadays. So if we expect uh, human verificators 
alone being actu actually able daily to uh, detect such a kind of messages, uh, this is actually impossible. So, but, but one point which uh, uh, I do want to underline uh, during this masterclass, which I, which I think is of main importance, is that human verification is required at the end as a final validation to avoid violating the right of freedom of expression. So we should always keep in mind that we are at the crossroad. And so we should try to employ automatic, met automatic methods to uh, actually ease the task of human verification verificators, but uh, without, um, uh, without without uh, assuming that uh, all these uh, automatic process is fully correct or it uh, hones in a way all the knowledge to take the right decision. So what are the open challenges for hate speech? Actually, there are many of them. Uh, why this is a challenging task? Well, uh, first of all, as we will see in a few minutes, there are disagreements uh, in how hate speech should be defined. So this is a uh, an issue uh, because uh, uh, we have, and this is also what we have seen in a way in this uh, table uh, a few uh, minutes ago. Actually, this means that uh, some content is considered uh, to be a speech by uh, some actors, for instance, some social media, but, and, and it's not considered uh, to be a speech uh, in, uh, by others. So this means that uh, the, the classification also the automatic classification becomes complex. And then this means that this is uh, the, the, the fact that uh, there is no, uh, no uniform definition of uh, hate speech. This is reflected on the fact that uh, then uh, the data sets that are uh, annotated for this supervised uh, task, uh, actually they uh, not only uh, comes from different sources, which is, uh, kind of a, a normal, meaning that uh, sometimes it, they are from Twitter, so sometimes they are from, uh, from Facebook, but it means also that sometimes they capture different information. And so even if the task is uh, it's always eight speech detection, in some cases, uh, the, the targeted content is, uh, is different. Maybe not hugely different, but still it's hard to uh, use uh, all these uh, data sets together. And this is a problem we faced uh, in our CRIP project. So uh, <clears throat> actually, there are some approaches uh, nowadays that have been uh, proposed uh, to detect its speech in uh, textual uh, content. They mainly rely on machine learning techniques. They are mainly uh, cl uh, class supervised classification tasks. The idea is uh, to take uh, and we will we will see it in detail uh, to take uh, uh, texts or so ideally a sentence or part of a sentence and uh, classify it as being uh, as containing a speech or not. Uh, the problem, uh, one of the problems that are that are faced by these kind of approaches is that uh, the decisions that are made are not always uh, easily interpretable by humans. This is a kind of a usual problem uh, when we employ machine learning and deep learning in particular methods. Uh, so this is also, uh, this is, uh, but the, in this case, it is particularly uh, important and, uh, and, they, and critical because we automatically censor uh, a speech, okay, uh, in an automatic way. So it is important to understand why such a test, such, such a text has been classified as a um, eight speech uh, text uh, so that we can explain this also to the, to the person uh, whom we, we, we actually censor the, the content. And also another point uh, which makes uh, this, uh, this system uh, challenging is that they, they should rely on external uh, source and external resources, uh, but this maintaining these resources and keeping them up to date is uh, really, really challenging. And we will also uh, see some of uh, these issues in, in more details uh, in a few minutes. So what are the take home message, messages that uh, uh, we have to uh, keep in mind uh, when we deal with hate speech detection? First of all, uh, 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 the first point may, may seem trivial, but it is not, is that the problem, the, the automatic detection of hate speech content is technically difficult. 
Then uh, we have that some approaches uh, achieved reasonable performance, meaning not uh, perfect uh, results. Specific challenges uh, remain, and uh, we will. Uh, uh, some of them has been uh, has been uh, uh, highlighted uh, in the slide, slide before, and then uh, I will detail some more uh, in the in the next slides. And then also there is a, the, the last point is is particularly important, meaning that without any kind of societal context, it's quite hard to make system that can actually generalize uh, sufficient. Uh, to classify uh, aid content uh, in uh, different uh, contexts uh, and uh, platforms uh, and uh, specific use cases. So let's now uh, go to have a look at the uh, definitions of uh, aid speech that are used uh, to, uh, to, to, to actually to define the guidelines to annotate those data sets that are then, that are then used to train uh, our uh, machine learning uh, methods. So the definition of a speech, unfortunately, uh, what I or, or said before is that is not universally accepted and uh, it has actually a number of individual facets uh, that, uh, that must be taken into account. So actually uh, it's, it's important to have a clear definition, uh, but uh, it, is, uh, it is hard to define this also because, as I already said, we are really at the crossroad between hate speech uh, and uh, free freedom of expression. So uh, this line between the two is, is really blurry uh, and uh, we, the, the need uh, if we are, let's say, if we are too strict in the definition of hate speech, we risk to, uh, to censor a lot of content. Otherwise, we risk to, uh, to, to make a lot of eight uh, content uh, just be classified as, uh, as a standard content and so without any harm. So uh, it, it, this is to say that it's very hard to already to provide such a definition. So here uh, I uh, listed some of them. Uh, and then I will uh, provide you uh, more definitions if we want to go behind the eight speech. And so two other kind of tasks that are uh, deeply related like cyber bullying detection uh, and, uh, and others. So for instance, for uh, the encyclopedia of the American, American constitution, we have the date speech is speech that attacks a person or group on the basis of attributes such as race, religion, ethnic origin, origin, national origin, sex, disability, sexual orientation, or gender identity. For Facebook, we uh, already uh, had a look at that. There are uh, then uh, three definitions that have been provided uh, by in the literature about hate speech detection. So. For instance, uh, by, uh, by Davidson uh, and uh, colleagues, we have that the language that, used, uh, that is used to express, uh, to express hatred towards uh, a targeted group or is intended to be derogatory, to humiliate or to insult the members of the group. By Gil the Gilbert, we have a hate speech is a deliberate attack directed towards a specific group of people motivated by aspects of the group's identity. And uh, by Fortuna, colleagues, we have hate speech is language that attacks or diminishes, that incites violence or hate against groups based on specific characteristics such as physical appearance, religion, descent, national or ethnic origin, sexual orientation, gender identity and or other, and it can occur with different linguistic styles, even in subtle forms and when humor is used. So I would say that the last one is the more uh, complete in a way, uh, while we can see that in a way the Facebook one uh, and uh, the, the Twitter one are uh, quite similar. So here there is a, a, an interesting in example uh, of a kind of messages that are actually uh, proposed to, uh, to Facebook workers to understand uh, what they, uh, whether this content violates their policies uh, and whether it has to be uh, deleted or uh, ignored. So for instance, uh, don't trust boys is violating this policy. 
uh, refugees uh, should face uh, the figuring score that this is violating. Uh, then there is uh, fucking Muslims is violating, this is deleted, while fucking migrants, for instance, is not violating, okay, because uh, is, uh, migrants are just kind of a uh, half protected uh, category for Facebook, and so this content uh, is uh, is something which can be published, uh, and then we can go on with uh, the French, uh, our colleagues, uh, or uh, all English people are dirty and so on. So this is violating because it's targeting a precise uh, group of people with uh, hateful content. So. Uh, and, and a kind of uh, necessary condition for some of the definitions of hate speech is that hate speech is directed to a group, okay? So not to a, a precise person. Uh, and this is also the, the distinction uh, between hate speech and cyberbullying, for instance, where cyberbullying uh, actually targets uh, a precise uh, user uh, on uh, a precise person on social networks. And we will, uh, we will see more uh, on that in uh, the next uh, slides. So a common theme among all these definitions is that the attack is based on some aspects of the group or people's identity. Uh, and then, uh, then the definition differs. Uh, the, the problem is uh, to uh, go beyond what conventional text-based classification approach are able to capture. And we will see some of uh, the definitions. So in general, uh, what we can retain from all these definitions and what uh, putting uh, all this together and uh, I, uh, I, uh, I, I suggest you to read the paper by Fortuna and, colleague, uh, for, and colleagues on uh, this topic because there is a, there is a really, very, uh, really precise analysis of the characteristics of hate speech. Is that hate speech is to incite violence or hate, it is to attack or diminish, it has specific targets. This is also a very important issue. It's not a general sentence, okay? The target should be very specific, otherwise it's not a speech. And the point in defining this is whether humor can be considered a speech or not. So the, the, the identification of uh, irony and humor uh, is uh, very important. So uh, uh, another problem uh, which uh, we can face when we, we, we take these definitions, which apparently may seem very, very clear okay, to, to, to you, uh, which is normal, but then as soon as you uh, start, and this is what we experienced, uh, and uh, Elena will, will say more about that, uh, as soon as you start annotating data from social networks, uh, trying to fit these definitions, Actually, sometimes there are examples where it's quite hard, even for, uh, for human annotators, to say whether it is hate or not. So a, a problem for, in particular for the automatic classification are also factual statements. Because for instance, if we say Jews are swine, this is clearly hate speech, okay? Uh, because it's a statement of inferiority. But if we say many Jews are lawyers, well, this is not, okay? So the problem is that uh, we need, it's not only the, 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 the basic analysis of, from the syntactic point of view of the, the sentences, but the point is also uh, to, to employ uh, external sources of, of knowledge. And these external sources of knowledge can give us a precise word interpretation, okay, in this uh, context. And in this way, we can, in, in a way, be able to provide a more semantic classification of what, uh, of the, 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 the sentence with respect to a speech. So another issue that uh, arises uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the definition of hate speech is the potential praising of a group that is hateful. Okay, this is a, a kind of uh, the, 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 the converse of what I said before. So for instance, praising the, the KKK uh, is hate speech. Uh, however, praising another group can clearly be no hate speech. Okay, so for instance, if we take the sentence, the Nazis were very efficient in terms of their final solution, okay, this is not hate speech, okay? So praising processing alone is difficult if we don't have any, uh, any kind 
of external sources of knowledge that can provide us with the context, which actually makes us um, makes us uh, provide the correct interpretation uh, of the world in this precise uh, context. So there are a number of data sets that has been created to uh, train systems. Uh, machine learning systems uh, to automatically classify uh, eight uh, content. So the idea is that uh, the, the, this data has been collected, uh, then some guidelines has been established so to define what are the different uh, categories, uh, what is the definition of eight speech first, and then what are the different categories that has to be annotated in this precise, uh, for this precise uh, data set. And then on these annotated data, uh, automatic classifiers are trained uh, to detect hate speech automatically. So uh, the, the, the point is that uh, the different annotators need to identify correctly and then agreeing between them uh, whether the specific text they are uh, annotating is hate speech uh, or not. And this is very difficult because uh, uh, as we say, as, as we already uh, said several times, there is no universal definition of its speech. So in general, the agreement between annotators uh, is uh, quite low, uh, and this has to be refined uh, along with several uh, agreement uh, sessions. So uh, another problem is that <clears throat> May, let's say the, the, the majority of the, um, of the cases of uh, eight speech uh, instances are social media platforms. But uh, social media platform content has, has a very strict uh, data user, usage policies associated, uh, of course, because of, uh, of uh, privacy policies and so on. But this means also as a consequence that a problem we have to face uh, as researchers Working on uh, the improve, working on improving uh, automatic uh, methods to detect uh, hate speech online. Well, actually, we have a small number of data sets available uh, to the public uh, to study this, this issue, and most of them uh, come from uh, from Twitter. Um, so the problem is that if we only consider Twitter and we only uh, take uh, data sets annotated on Twitter, uh, then our systems uh, will have a general, uh, will have a limited general applicability because as soon as we move to uh, other kind of uh, posts or, or online content, uh, for instance, with, with no uh, character limitation, uh, with a longer uh, text and so on, uh, then we will have, uh, we will have, uh, we will not uh, uh, obtain the same uh, performance as for uh, the classification of Twitter posts. So for instance, uh, if we move to Facebook or Instagram or TikTok, well, actually, just first, if we go to Facebook, we, we cannot take into account just short uh, text. And if we move to Instagram, we have, uh, in addition, the issue of combining the, um, in a way, the information we can, uh, we can, uh, we can uh, extract from images to the, uh, to the information we can, we can extract from the messages uh, and the caption posted uh, with, with, uh, with the image. And then if we move to TikTok, it, we have uh, also other issues more related to videos uh, and so on. So uh, also including additional uh, context and additional uh, data and metadata is, uh, is important, but it is quite complex uh, for this task. So in general, there are not many public available uh, data sets uh, to identify hateful, aggressive and insulting text. So, First of all, then we, uh, we will have a quick uh, uh, overview on uh, some of them, the main methods that are used. So for instance, there is eight base. Here you may find the link, uh, which uh, uh, actually is uh, um, 
structured repository uh, containing uh, eight speech uh, over uh, 45 uh, languages, okay? So there are really uh, all the, uh, the, the vocabulary which is used to uh, identify uh, these kind of, of, uh, of issues. So here there is the number of terms uh, and actually the number of languages uh, is uh, 97. So uh, one of the uh, most used uh, data set is the eight base uh, Twitter data set, uh, which contains uh, uh, about uh, 20 published in uh, 2017. And this is the procedure they, the author uh, used to create the data set. So they took a hate speech lexicon. Uh, this was from eight base. So this kind of lexicon can be used uh, as uh, to, on the one side to perform the annotation and on the other side to uh, improve the performance of the system uh, by using it as one of the features uh, of, the, of, the, of the machine learning uh, system to detect its speech. So they search uh, online on Twitter for tweets containing these uh, terms, the, the eight speech lexicon from eight base, and they uh, selected uh, about uh, 33,000 uh, users, okay? Uh, then they took a timeline from all these users, resulting in about uh, 85 million of tweets. Okay, so it's, it's quite a huge amount of, uh, of tweets. And then from these tweets, they took a random sample uh, of uh, uh, two uh, uh, 25k tweets uh, containing terms from uh, the uh, eight base lexicon. And then via crowdsourcing, they annotated this tweet. Uh, with uh, three labels, eight speech, offensive, but not eight speech, and neither eight speech nor offensive, okay? So um, the offensive is uh, a kind of language which is, uh, which is using uh, swear words and so on, but which is not targeting a precise group uh, and which is not, does not fit in the definitions that we, uh, we have uh, seen a few minutes ago. So, uh, it, when the agreement between the annotators was uh, too low, then the tweet was excluded from the set just to, to, to ensure uh, the reliability of the resource. And uh, a commonly used subset of this data set uh, is available and it contains uh, 14,000 uh, tweets. So this is uh, uh, the, the kind uh, of... Uh, um, of, uh, of words uh, we, we have, uh, taking into account unigrams, uh, uh, bigrams, and trigrams. Um, so the, the kind uh, of, uh, of people, uh, we, uh, of words we can, we can find uh, one after the others in the uh, eight uh, content. So here we have a number of words uh, like racist, queer, speak, and so on for hate, for uh, offensive, uh, we have other words uh, like uh, shit, put, and so on. And then there are a number of words that are actually not containing, that are nor uh, hateful, uh, uh, neither uh, offensive. And here you can see how the, the, the kind of a part of the sentences uh, look like in uh, the bigram and the trigrams. Just to give you an example of the kind of uh, vocabulary we are talking about, even if it is not really a pleasure to uh, to read it. So uh, on the other side, there has been another uh, Twitter dataset that has been published uh, in uh, 2016 and then 2018, uh, which is the uh, two Vazim's uh, data uh, of uh, 16,000 uh, tweets, uh, which are labeled uh, with racist, sexist or neither. So this is a, a kind of more fine-grained uh, classification of uh, this kind of content. Uh, and uh, they created a corpus uh, which, uh, which contains the slurs and terms related to religious, sexual, gender, and hated uh, these uh, 16,000 tweets. Uh, and they had also an interesting gender study on uh, these uh, annotations. And then uh, the first author, so Wazim, uh, created also another data set uh, 
from uh, the first uh, uh, corpus of tweets uh, they, uh, they, cre they created in, uh, in the first work. Uh, and actually, they recruited uh, feminists and anti racist activists, uh, along with crowdsourcing, to annotate these tweets. And again, the labels uh, were racist, sexist, neither, or both. So this is a, uh, the kind of um, the kind of uh, let's say statistics they, they we can extract from the first data set, uh, where I think the the, the 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 title of the paper is quite uh, quite 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 interesting, which is eightfold symbols or eightfold people. So here they really want uh, to see uh, how many of these. Uh, uh, Eightful messages uh, are, are proposed by uh, men, by women, uh, or by unidentified uh, users on on Twitter. And so, as we can see, uh, most of them are uh, from from men, uh, very few from women. But of course, we have a number of unidentified uh, uh, users that where we cannot say whether they they was a, a woman or man. And here we have also the percentage of the kind of hateful messages that they spread on, on networks with respect to racism, to sexism, sexism and need. And here also you will have the distribution of the 10 most frequently occurring terms for sexism and racism. So this is a, you can uh, have, a, have a look at some of them. So. Another data set that has been uh, published in this context uh, is uh, the Stormfront data set, uh, uh, where uh, the posts from uh, a forum called uh, Stormfront uh, from, um, uh, let's say, that are, uh, that are uh, let's say, used by uh, white supremacists uh, has been annotated. So these posts uh, are, are being annotated at sentence level. So we have at the end uh, about uh, 10,000 uh, sentences that are labeled with eight, no eight, relation or skip labels. Okay. We have that eight, no eight in the indicated presence or, or, or not of eight speech in the sentence. Why relation indicates uh, whether the sentence uh, uh, is its speech when it is combined with the sentences around it, meaning that uh, to classify this, uh, it, it means that you, you, you can classify it as H if the context of this sentence is actually eight. And then we have skip for sentences that were uh, non-English or not containing information uh, related to eight or non-eight speech. And then they also capture uh, the, 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 context, the, the context that uh, an annotator uh, knew, needed to uh, classify the, the text. So here again, we have an overview uh, concerning unigrams, the bigrams and trigrams of eight and non-eight uh, content. So for non-eight, uh, we have uh, thank, welcome, YouTube, idea, check, and so on. Why for eight, uh, we have race, uh, white, uh, Africa, as a place, and so on. So these are the words. And then you can have also the bigrams and trigrams, uh, which actually provide better the context of uh, these eightful uh, word and how they relate with the, the words uh, in the same sentence. Then there is the track data set, uh, which has uh, been uh, proposed uh, in, uh, in the context of the, the the, the shared uh, the shared the shared task uh, by the worship of on trolling aggression and cyberbullying and the idea was to detect aggressive text in both English and Hindi so it was multilingual um, and uh, uh, aggressive text was uh, uh, seen as a component of its speech and here we have actually Facebook comments that are annotated uh, with the labels which are overtly aggressive covertly aggressive or non-aggressive, okay? And uh, with this shared task, there is also a small Twitter data set which is annotated uh, with the same labels, and it consists of uh, about 1,000 uh, tweets. Again, same uh, as before for Facebook, here there are uh, the, the three uh, unigrams, uh, bigrams, uh, and trigrams uh, for the overtly aggressive, covertly aggressive, uh, and the non-aggressive uh, sentences. 
So also in this case, uh, we have uh, a number of uh, interesting examples of the kind of uh, words and lexicon we can find in hateful messages. And then recently, there is the, the hate of all, um, uh, challenge uh, in the context of uh, Semeval 2019, which was the task uh, five. Uh, the idea was to have a multilingual detection of hate targeting to women and immigrants in tweet. Okay, so here it, the, the task is more focused than general aid speech. Okay, uh, so uh, there have been several uh, sets of labels associated to the tweets. Uh, so we have whether the tweet expresses aid towards women or immigrants, uh, whether the tweet is aggressive, and whether the tweet is uh, direct at an individual or an entire group. Okay, or not, uh, meaning that uh, not, uh, not all the definitions of uh, hate speech consider that uh, it, uh, hate speech is not uh, targeting a precise group or individual. And here again, we have uh, the examples of from the HateVal uh, data sets uh, concerning unigram, bigram, and trigrams. So non hate, we have uh, immigrant, man, ram, and so on, uh, while for instance, uh, um, for hate, we have uh, MAGA, so Make America Great Again, uh, Build the Wall, uh, Illegal, uh, Women Sucks, and so on. Okay, so, and again, uh, we have also uh, the, 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 the different uh, um, trigrams, which gives us uh, more, uh, the, more the context of the sentence. Then there is the Kaggle dataset. Uh, which is also done a shared task uh, on detecting insulting comments. So Kaggle is the popular uh, platform. And here we have uh, about uh, 8,000 uh, social media comments that are labeled as insulting or uh, not. And finally, we have the German Twitter dataset uh, created uh, in German, so for, for German, uh, about the European refugee crisis. So here we have, uh, it's very small, uh, it's uh, 500 tweets in German, uh, which are just uh, lab labeled with the binary, uh, with two labels, so eight or not eight. So here there is a, an overview of the data sets that I presented you, uh, just to understand how much these labels are uh, present in the whole data set. Okay, and uh, as you can see, these data sets are uh, actually uh, almost all of them are highly unbalanced, meaning that usually uh, we have that only few of them uh, contain uh, eight, uh, eight content. Uh, and for instance, if we take the Wasim B uh, or the Wasim A uh, data set, so the two data sets from, from Wasim, uh, so uh, this is the case, same for uh, Stormfront uh, and, uh, and also for uh, ATVAL, for instance. So the point is that uh, actually, um, uh, Hopefully, let's say uh, hate speech occurs uh, at a very uh, low rate compared to non hate speech, in particular on platforms like Twitter, which is the most, the main target of this kind of data sets. So, this means that this results in a kind of imbalance uh, in the number of eight and non eight uh, text uh, within the data sets. And this also, uh, in a way, uh, let's say, uh, influence the results. Uh, of the uh, of the training and on the, of the performance of a, a machine learning system uh, trained on these data sets. And another another uh, consideration that we can uh, we can have on these data sets is that uh, yeah. they vary considerably in their size, scope, characteristics, uh, and also the kind of a fine grained uh, eight speech content that they uh, annotate. So this is another important issue. So in general, uh, how automatic approaches work? So. Uh, the idea is that uh, even if there are rules, as, as we have seen uh, from social media platforms, saying that you cannot publish uh, hateful content, uh, actually, uh, this content is published on, uh, on the web. And so uh, there is a need for content moderators. So the idea is that uh, automatic tools uh, can accelerate the reviewing process and allocate the uh, content moderators, human content moderators, only to those posts that really require a cl close human examination. 
So there are different kind of approaches, and now I will uh, quickly go uh, we we'll go through uh, all of them uh, before uh, leaving the floor to to Elena for describing our work on on Gridpod. So there are keywords based approaches. This is the easiest, uh, the simplest kind of approach. So they use either an ontology or a dictionary. Uh, the text that contain potential uh, hateful content is identified. Uh, and then we have uh, that uh, eight bits, for instance, uh, is, is used as a, as a, as a standard uh, database of terms for hate speech. Uh, and then uh, the problem is that just using such a kind of keyword uh, is, uh, is, is not enough to detect uh, this kind of uh, this this kind of content uh, because in a way if we detect for instance only racial slurs uh, then we could we could we could result in a high precise system but with a lower call okay uh, and we can uh, we can uh, uh, miss in a way uh, the hateful content uh, which does not use these terms, which is another another problem. And then also sometimes these terms that are classified as uh, hateful uh, terms like trash, swine, and so on, sometimes that are not used in a, in a hateful way, okay? And so we create uh, many false, uh, in a way, false uh, alarms uh, that increase the recall at the expense of prestige. So um, the, the idea uh, is that uh, if we uh, this, this kind of um, this kind of approaches miss also uh, hate speech content like uh, those which does not contain. Uh, any kind of slur words uh, or, uh, or, uh, or, or words that are uh, explicitly classified as uh, hateful. So for instance, uh, a slang such as build a wall, okay, uh, which uh, means uh, constructing the physical barrier, okay, uh, uh, it's, it's not harmful, it's not hateful uh, as, as a sentence, okay, but it may be interpreted as a condemnation of immigrants in the United States, and so they they have a, it has a precise uh, meaning, a precise hateful meaning. And so we want to be able to detect also such kind of uh, examples. Another uh, important uh, point in these automatic uh, approaches is that we need to uh, collect also some kind of source metadata. This helps a lot. Uh, because uh, having uh, the demographics of the posting user, uh, the location, the timestamp, uh, the social engagement on the platform for this user, for instance, uh, these are all information that are very, very useful to provide a better, a better classification of uh, hate speech content. And this information uh, is not often uh, available to researchers external to social media platforms because this data is uh, sensitive uh, and it raises uh, privacy issues. Another problem is that uh, there is a risk of a kind of bias uh, using this such kind of metadata because if we uh, train on this data, or only on this data, uh, we can uh, have some bias uh, with respect to certain users or groups, okay? Uh, meaning that uh, some, sometimes uh, we can flag their post as hateful, uh, even if uh, sometimes uh, they, they are not, okay? And we, will, we want to always preserve uh, the freedom of expression. So this is, a, a, this is an issue. And also the same is that uh, using just relying too much on this kind of uh, metadata on this demographic information, uh, we may miss some hateful uh, message, which is from someone who does not typically uh, post hateful uh, content. And then there has been a number of machine learning approaches uh, that uh, has been proposed. So the first step of these uh, uh, systems is always the content pre-processing. So there are a number of them which we can take into account. It's pretty, some of them are pretty standard uh, for uh, text classification uh, tasks in general. So uh, the, the idea uh, is that uh, we, can, uh, we can take the, in, the n grams, so uh, the sequence of n consecutive words as we have seen. So uh, 
so uh, the big rams, the three rams, uh, and so on. Uh, and we can we can also uh, take uh, stemmed words, so that we can take only the root of the of, of the word. We can use bag of words. Uh, where uh, a, a sentence, a, a post, on or a tweet is represented as a set of words or engrams without any kind of ordering, and then we can rank them uh, using, for instance, uh, TF-IDF. Then we have distributional features to word embeddings uh, like word to back, which we can also use, where we can have the kind of context of the words, so uh, not only just the, the, the words as it is. And uh, we can also employ uh, sentiment and uh, emotions. So just not to run too late, I will skip this uh, further classification of the features for its speech. And I will move to the systems. So for instance, uh, we have the standard machine learning uh, system that can be used. So knife based uh, super vector machines, logistic regressions, in particular for uh, SVM and uh, logistic regression. We have a, a linear classification, okay, where we predict the classes based on a combination of the scores of the features, like those that uh, we discussed a few minutes uh, ago. Uh, and thanks to that, we can go to a text uh, classification. Then we have uh, approaches like, for, for instance, uh, uh, the one uh, by Davidson and colleagues in 2017. Well, actually, they use SVM uh, and uh, they, uh, they, they use actually distributional uh, TFIDF features and part of speech tags, plus some other linguistic features on SVM. Uh, and then uh, they, uh, they have uh, that these actually, uh, the combination of these linguistic features uh, with uh, the, the ranking provided by uh, TFIDF actually uh, uh, allowed to identify uh, the, the different usages of the terms uh, whether in eight speech messages or, or not. Still, uh, this kind of approach suffers from uh, some, some drawbacks, uh, like the fact that uh, when a, an offensive term is used in a positive sense. So in this case, uh, like if we find um, uh, a sentence like, he's a damn good actor, uh, as a gay man, it's awesome to see uh, an openly queer actor uh, give, given the lead role uh, for a major film, okay? This is from 8Base, uh, the 8Base uh, Twitter data set. Actually here, queer is used in a positive uh, connotation and uh, it has not be uh, not to be classified as a uh, hateful content. And then we have uh, the approach based, uh, for instance, on uh, convolutional neural networks uh, proposed in 2018 uh, at, uh, at LREC, uh, where, where we have uh, neural networks which are employed. Um, and uh, these networks are then combined uh, in, uh, in the scores. And also here, linguistic features like those that I showed you before has been employed. And then we have even more complex approaches like uh, the CGRU, which is based on a combination of uh, convolutional neural networks and uh, gate their current units to detect hate speech. And here, for instance, the authors uh, used the hate based Twitter dataset to uh, detect eight or offense, eight content or not. Uh, here, it has to be noticed that even if they use this dataset, they use it as a binary classification task instead of the, the, three, uh, the three classes. And then other approaches now uh, employ uh, also uh, fast text uh, using embeddings for character and grams, and also uh, in particular the, the, the recent uh, popular uh, language model based on BERT, uh, which are uh, actually uh, providing uh, really a boosting in, in the performances, uh, not only in eight speech detection, but also in other uh, text classification uh, tasks. And also all uh, the BERT-based language models like Roberta, Albert, or Dissilbert uh, can be uh, profitably used. 
So here there is a, an overview of the kind of results uh, we have uh, by employing a BERT, for instance, which you can see uh, actually it uh, outperforms uh, all the other uh, approaches. Okay, uh, and uh, here there is uh, the, the, here there are the results on the different data sets like uh, Stormfront or uh, Hateval uh, track. So as you can see, actually results. Uh, are um, are uh, are good, but as you can see, it's not uh, they do not attain in a way uh, the, the, the 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 perfection. So it means that we do need a kind of a validation uh, at the end. So here there are the results for the hate based Twitter and the results for uh, the Facebook. As you can as you can see. The results on Facebook are much more, uh, uh, much worse than those for 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 Twitter. And then, if we want to go behind hate speech, we have to take into account that hate speech is one kind of uh, text, uh, harmful text that we can find online. For instance, uh, so. This is, uh, if we take uh, this sentence, uh, assimilate, no, they all need to go back to their own countries, uh, ban Muslims, sorry if someone agrees to bad. So this is a, a kind of hate speech because it targets a precise group of, a precise individual or a precise group of people based on their characteristics. Then we have abusive language, which is different. It bears the purpose of insulting individuals and groups and can include hate speech, okay? and also offensive language. For instance, we may have all you perverts other than me who posted today needs to leave the board, or uh, I spend my money how I want to be, it's my business, okay? And then we have bullying, which is another kind uh, of, um, another kind of task, uh, bullying or cyberbullying detection, which has the purpose to harass, threaten, or intimidate, typically individuals rather than groups. So for instance, here we, we have our class prom night just got ruined because you showed up, who invented you anyway, who invited you anyway. So this is the kind of pooling we can have. And here we have a whole list of, uh, of kinds of hateful content uh, we can face with automatic approaches. So we have hate speech, we have cyber bullying, we have discrimination, we have flaming, we have abusive language, we have profanity, okay, uh, which is another kind of a Soviet speech. Uh, we have toxic language or context. We are, here we have, uh, for instance, comments that are rude, disrespectful, or unreasonable messages that are likely to make a person to leave a discussion. Then we have extremism, uh, where ide ideology is associated to such a kind of messages. Uh, and then we have radicalization, okay where these uh, led to, uh, to uh, terrorism or nationalism uh, or precise communities against uh, certain, um, certain nationalities or group of peoples. So as you can see, uh, hate speech is uh, a very uh, um, a quite a precise target we can, we can uh, target uh, first, but then, there is a whole list of definitions of hateful content that we can take into account. And then to go behind hate speech, actually there are other, uh, at least uh, four uh, tasks that we might want to take into account uh, because they are highly relevant for uh, the detection of hateful or harmful content in general. So we have that knowledge-based features such as uh, messages mapped to stereotypical concepts in a knowledge base should be taken into account, for instance. Then we have multimodal information, for instance, image captions, pixel features, uh, the features of videos, for instance, they are used in cyberbullying detection uh, because, uh, of course, uh, uh, cyberbullying is often associating, uh, the comments are often linked to the image or videos, for instance, or on Instagram. And then we have uh, the uh, auto profiling for abusive language detection that has been shown to provide uh, really um, a boosting in the performances of, uh, the, of the, 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 the machine learning system uh, using uh, this kind of hate speech classification. 
And finally, uh, another uh, very recent uh, approach that has been proposed uh, in, uh, in, the, in the NLP uh, community, which is to generate counter narratives automatically to fight hate speech. So the idea is that, uh, yes, we want to identify automatically what, what, are, what are the uh, messages containing harmful content, but on the other side, we don't want then to go through content moderation, meaning that we want to uh, delete, remove some message or uh, some content, but we want to engage in a counter narrative, uh, engage a counter narrative to fight these messages and to show, uh, to, to, to show people why these messages are harmful uh, and should be uh, avoided. So uh, this is the list of uh, references of which I am mentioned. And now uh, I leave the floor to Elena to present uh, our approach in the CUIP project. Thanks, uh, thanks, Elena. So I will share my slides. You can see them. Yeah, okay. Yes. Perfect. So, good afternoon to everyone. So, I am uh, Irena Cabrio. Serena already introduced us. So, I will follow the presentation of Serena that was more, let's say, general. And I will focus on the work that we have carried out in a two year project called CRIP. Uh, and I will present mainly our part and also some of the uh, methods and results that were obtained by uh, some, uh, part, some other researcher that were partnered in the same project. So, sorry, I will put, okay. So here is just to give you an introduction of the CRIP team. So it was a cyberbullying event prevention. That was the, the name of the, of the project that was accepted and funded by the EIT Digital Wellbeing uh, Research Project Call. So in this, uh, in this uh, team, it was, it was me, Serena, two other uh, research engineers on the team, so Michele Corazza and uh, Pinara Arslan, that are no more in the team. And then our colleague from Fondazione Bruno Kessler in Italy from the Digital Humanity team, so Sara Sonelli and uh, Stefano Menini. And I uh, would like to thank them also for some of the content of this presentation. So uh, the CRIP project, uh, had for objective to develop tools to support the detection and prevention of psychological behavioral problems of cyberbullying teenage victims. And the idea was to try to combine social media monitoring and motivational technologies. So we were mainly focusing in our work on social media monitoring, but some of our partners were more focusing on virtual coaching uh, that were integrating chatbots to exchange with bullying and with victims with some psychological support. So the stakeholders in the project were school and local and national authorities. So we were targeting uh, the cyberbullying issue in schools, not in social media uh, platforms in general, even if then we use the social, classical social media platform for running our experiments. And then the CRIP project was actually evaluated in the living lab environment through surveys that were distributed to students, teachers that actually were part of the project, and also through structured interviews, focus groups with selected students and teachers. So just uh, to, sorry, okay. I will stop sharing this slide. I will show you the uh, video that uh, was uh, presenting the, um, the project. So, sorry, I will now share. Okay, with audio, so you should be able to listen the video. Mm -hmm. How many cases of online bullying have appeared in newspapers and TV newscasts? 
Only the most obvious ones, because the minority of cases remain hidden from the public eye. Cyberbullying victims tend to shut themselves in, thus worsening the potential dangers and making it difficult to identify the first signs of violence. The identification and awareness of the first signs of cyberbullying is the best method of defense and prevention. Creep is the result of in-depth research and simulation developed by a team of experts to prevent cyberbullying and to help the victims who suffer from it. Creep analyzes text content on the web and on social networks. It identifies potential hate speeches and automatically categorizes the contents to identify any potential critical issues which may be hidden amongst millions of sentences. Creep also acts as a virtual coach through an app to help the victims of cyberbullying by supporting them on how to handle these situations and making communication easier with friends, parents, and other relatives. Creep is the most complete solution for public administration and educational institutions that want to tackle online bullying. Okay, so that was the video presentation. I will go back to my slides. Okay. Uh, so just as a disclaimer, uh, this presentation contains examples of language that may be offensive to some of you. Uh, so of course, that's not my view. So as I just said, as an introduction, we mainly worked on creep semantic technology. So that was the part uh, mainly based on natural language processing and text mining in which we developed the pipeline to be able to start from social media messages and to go till the identification of cyberbullying, of hate speech first and then cyberbullying. So we had different steps that I will then describe in more detail. So we were starting from messages extracted from some platform as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and other. The first phase was to be able to analyze the network. So basically the messages exchanged on social media were, were uh, represented as a graph in which the nodes were the user and the different edges were the mess messages exchanged among the users. And then we were able basically to segment such graphs to focus on the communities of interest. And then the second, um, the second uh, module in the pipeline was to extract the messages exchanged in a certain specific community to be able to assign a label of hate speech or not hate speech to each message. So different kind of uh, features and characteristics was used to the case as emotion, sentiment, and there was also uh, some studies on stereometry, and there the idea of stereometry is to be able to detect automatically from messages the age, for instance, and the gender of the person for, to, to fight cases of uh, grooming or cases in which an elderly person um, plays and uh, says something like I'm much more younger than what I, I, I actually am and so on. And so different kind of features were actually useful to the goal. I will now enter into, to, into more details about the uh, creep, uh, uh, the creep uh, semantic technology, and I will show just one more demo before really starting and focusing on the different aspects. Okay, so here we go. Welcome to the Creep Semantic Technology Demo. We will demonstrate to you how artificial intelligence methods can be used to automatically detect cyberbullying instances in online social networks. The Creep Semantic Technology takes into account two elements to detect cyberbullying phenomena. First, it considers the network, the messages sent among the social network users.
Second, the creep semantic technology considers the messages posted on the social network and their content, using natural language processing methods. More precisely, we rely on sentiment analysis, emotion recognition and argument mining to address this task. The Creep Semantic technology allows to automatically detect interactions among social network users containing hate speech messages, have an overall view of the bully's network and its connections, and reveal the specific keywords used in hate speech message instances. Okay. So I will now go through the slides again. Okay, so here we go. So sorry for all this exchange, but in general demo and videos are quite interesting and clear to, 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 to better to better show uh, the results that we obtained. So as to start with the first step that was presented, uh, there was a part on network analysis. And for network analysis, we take the Trentino use case to show you how that was uh, carried out. Uh, we use a Trentino, so Trentino is a region in Italy on the Northeast where Fondazione Bruno Kessler, that were one of our partners uh, is actually acting. And, uh, um, Trentino was actually one of our use case in the project. So here the idea was that we cannot identify cyberbullying just looking at the text. We actually need to have more information. We need information from the users, interactions, the community to which they belong, the online activity uh, that they have. And all this information allows us to understand and to detect cyberbullying together, of course, with the content of the messages. So um, in the use case of the project, we wanted to be able to extract network of students in Trentino to focus on those communities. So we had uh, 34 local high schools, and then we uh, start from them to try to gather information using Instagram about the students in there. So we actually started from the pictures, given that, of course, uh, Instagram does not, does not allow to, um, to have uh, this kind of uh, this tagging, we started from images. So we basically collected all the images and their uh, tags, if one of the tags was actually one of, school, of the school in Trentino. So if people were tagged in those images, we could suppose that actually they were strongly related to those schools and that we could suppose that they were students. Actually, not only students were in there, but also teachers and so on. So uh, starting from that, we wanted actually to be able to collect communities of users that are strongly connected from exchanges of messages. So we started from the images, as I said, and we collected the list of users related to local schools. And then, starting from that, we went step further. So from those users, we were able to collect a few amount of information about age, birth, year, schools, university, and so on. And then we were checking about their posts. And then, about starting from that, we were enlarging our collection phase, our expansion uh, step, let's say. So we collected a second layer. So starting from the list of the users commenting first layers users. And we did not uh, exploit the likes because actually we didn't want to add uh, additional noise to the, the to this uh, search, uh, uh, to this, sorry, to this expansion phase. And so we only focus on people that were actually commenting pictures. And then to go even further, we also collected the second layer. So people commenting uh, comments of the first people layer. And starting from that, from 31st high school, we got to the first layer of five, more than uh, almost 600 students, and then, sorry, uh, 600 users. And then at the second step, we gather around 6,000 users. And then we step even, I mean, as a third layer, it was much more. 
uh, much more big. So in this, in this way, we could be able to create a huge community of uh, people that were actually interacting each other. So a sort of, uh, um, let's say, uh, a community uh, that were strongly dependent. And then after that, what we were able to do, what we wanted to do was to be able to identify community of users um, that were exchanging very frequent messages. So after this first expansion phase, we then used, we then applied other methods to identify sub communities of among all these users. Uh, and therefore we uh, selected nodes that were highly uh, active, let's say. So basically nodes of people that were communicating a lot among them. And uh, we uh, exploit such inf uh, information about geolocalization and also about uh, uh, personal information to filter out all people that were not actually students. So teachers and so on, we uh, check the, 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 the jobs. So to be able to filter away this kind of people. And this was also done semi-automatically. So we also checked uh, some of them uh, and manually for, for the cases. Uh, so um, starting from all these sub-communities, we wanted to be able to have a, an interesting graph for us in which we could recognize some patterns that are typical of cyberbullying uh, phenomena. So for instance, having a node that is frequently attacked by other node that does not actually answer with the same frequency. But this kind of uh, patterns can be typical of uh, stars, for instance. So we can have celebrities that receive a lot of messages, but they do not answer with the same frequency. But that can also be a typical pattern of cyberbullying. So the person that is actually a victim is attacked, receives a lot of messages, but does not answer in the same way. So we wanted to be able to identify these kind of patterns to then be able to extract key concepts out of there and then uh, run the second module that is actually the hate speech detection. So uh, for instance, these were uh, some of the example of the key concepts. So in these cases, we're in Italian because that was our uh, use case. And then uh, of course, we are not interested in uh, keeping the students um, uh, the student's profile that was just for, to allow us to have like uh, stronger connected messages. Um, so we want we use this kind of uh, key concepts also to exclude unwanted communities. So all the communities in which we have, uh, for instance, a lot of uh, a vocabulary that is not of interest to us, we filter them away. And then in these uh, uh, with these sets of messages exchanged by these small communities, we run the second, the second module in our pipeline. And the second module in our pipeline is the abusive language detection system. So once we have collected the network that are actually of interest to us, we can now run the hate speech module. So being able actually to pre-process each sentence to understand if it contains or not hate speech uh, or abusive uh, abusive content. Uh, the, the first part on the network analysis is quite simple, let's say. That was just a use case uh, for us. And uh, we did it for the Trentino area, we did it for the Manchester area to try to see if there were some commonalities and so on. But I think that we, we should investigate further all these, uh, all these aspects and run more sophisticated algorithms for this kind of uh, explorations. The second uh, module, and it's actually the part in which uh, uh, we uh, mainly worked, um, we implemented a robust cross-language neural architecture for hate speech detection. So we carried out an extensive analysis of the contribution of the components and features of the results. So what we wanted to have here is that, okay, we pick all the state-of-the-art technology that Serena presented just before, and we try to see how it actually works, which are the performances in our setting. We had uh, really a lot of features that we present uh, just uh, right after, and we wanted to see how, um, which were the impact of these features into social media data, because actually that's not the classic, the standard uh, language, but it's a very specific kind of language in which 
uh, there, is, there is a lot of noise in which there are a lot of abbreviation of a lot of jargon. It's quite of challenges, uh, challenging kind of uh, language to, to treat. So as for data set for our experiments, uh, we uh, relied on the standard uh, benchmarks for evaluation. Some of those Serena just uh, presented before and some I will uh, write, present it right now. So for English, VASM and OVI uh, made available a corpus of 16,000 suites that were actually annotated as being hate speech or not. And actually, they provided also some sort of uh, some subclassification that we did not use at this, uh, this phase. Uh, for Italian, we relied on the data of the hate speech detection task that was proposed at Evalita in 2018, in which, again, 4,000 tweets were actually annotated as hateful post or not. Uh, while before in the data set of uh, VASEM, we just have the Twitter data, here we have Twitter and Facebook data as well. And actually what they also uh, propose as challenge is to do some sort of cross-platform evaluation. So try to, trying to uh, train the system on Facebook and test on Twitter and vice versa. So to see how much the methods are actually uh, platform independent. And then for German, we use the offensive language detection data set that was uh, actually uh, made available by the Germeval challenge uh, to which we participated in uh, 2018 and 2019. Again, also here we had the five tag on tweet uh, uh, annotated as being offensive or other. So these uh, three data sets are actually the data set that we used in our experiments because we need available data. We do not want to crawl uh, platforms to be able to extract this data. And in any case, we need a lot of data for training. So we cannot uh, run uh, annotation uh, studies uh, in this uh, extensive way. So we used available data. So we took part into these uh, challenges as well. And this is why we, we, can, uh, we can also have the data. And we classified, uh, we, we ranked quite, uh, I mean, it was, uh, we, we got uh, satisfactory results with the method that I will uh, present you just uh, in, in a few minutes. So here it is. So we built a pipeline architecture uh, based on uh, Keras, uh, in which we uh, rely on a recurrent neural network uh, method with a lot of features, as I said, and uh, uh, different kind of pre-processing. So actually here, the goal was not to be implement the best pipeline ever, but was to implement a pipeline that was robust enough to perform satisfact in a satisfactory way on different platforms in terms of social media platforms and for different languages. So what we wanted to do was to, to build some sort of uh, general enough uh, platform in which we could just change some feature, some pre-processing method, and can be adapted to different languages. So, uh, in the I, I will not go too much into the details. I will. Um, you, you can, if you're interested, you can read the paper that I just mentioned there. And uh, we tested different kind of pre-processing as mentioned replacement, hashtag splitting, URL replacement. So where do we have mentions and URL, instead of leaving the URL and the mention as they are, we replace them with some placeholders in order not to be biased by this. In terms of hashtag splittings, we actually cut the hashtag given that um, often they are actually composed by different words. So we wanted to split them to be able to use those words in the later processing. As features, we tested very um, a variety of features as well. So both word embeddings and social features, as for instance, uh, emotion, lexica, and so on. I will describe that uh, in more details. And then at the end, the task was a binary classification. So each message was labeled as either hate speech or non-hate speech. So in terms of features, uh, we, different, we tested a different kind of, uh, of uh, families of features, so word embeddings, so comparing social media word embeddings uh, versus generic embedding spaces, as for instance, uh, fast text that is trained on the common Chrome. And uh, as for social media embeddings, uh, uh, we generated them um, 
in terms of uh, vectorial spaces of uh, the uh, emojis context. We have, uh, yeah, so emoji embeddings uh, as well, uh, comparing uh, embedding spaces from social media and generic embedding spaces where no emojis uh, were considered. And we also tested uh, replacing emojis with their description. So when we had like a smiling uh, emoji, we're, we were actually replacing it with uh, smiling faces. And then we tested uh, n-grams, so unigrams, d-grams, in order to capture lexical similarities as features. And then we also tested uh, social network specific features, as for instance, punctuation, uppercase, words, hashtags, that are very typical for, for uh, the uh, text that is used in social networks. So a lot of times you can have uppercase uh, words to say something like to, to scream something, or for instance, different kind of punctuation marks or question marks and so on that actually mean something in social media. And then we also tested emotional lexica, uh, for the languages for which they were available. So uh, those uh, lexica are actually list of words that are annotated with uh, emotions. So in general, eight types of emotions like uh, fear, anger, uh, happiness, and so on, and uh, polarity as well. So uh, both of them are bilingual, while the first one is kind of genuinely uh, uh, multilingual, the second one was created for Italian and then translated for the different languages. Uh, for uh, each language, we tested different kind of embeddings and uh, all possible combination of features. So embeddings, unigrams, digrams, social features, and the lexica. We tested three possible recurrent layer, so LSTM, so long short term memory, GRU, and bidirectional SDM. Uh, we train models with and without the hashtag splitting that I just uh, explained. And then we also tested models transcribing emoji when uh, uh, the description and models uh, were actually available as well. And uh, we also tested the impact of having emoji in the embedding space. And uh, uh, we ran experiments for a lot of time, actually. So we tested uh, 1,800 configuration for English, 1,080 configuration for Italian, and 1,200 uh, configurations for German. Uh, the different number of configuration depends on the availability of the different embedding or the different uh, uh, features. And uh, here I will show you some of the results that were actually obtained. So. Uh, actually, we wanted to see which was which were the feature that contributed most in the different for the different languages. So, uh, for the English data, the uh, best configuration is the first line. The first sorry is the first one for which uh, we have the, uh, the, the highest F measure. That is actually exploits fast text embeddings that uh, actually relies on hashtag splittings and that uses LSTM as a network. So that was the best configuration for, for English. Uh, some other configuration are very close, like for instance, the transcription of emoji actually plays an important role. So there's just like a, a very, a very short difference between the two. As for uh, Italian, Italian uh, we can see that uh, we have a similar configuration that uh, actually obtains uh, the best results. Uh, so as textual feature, we use embeddings and unigrams, uh, again, uh, um, with the transcription of the emojis and again with the hashtag splitting. For German, the best configuration is actually uh, slightly uh, different. So uh, the, the best one exploits uh, fast text embeddings uh, um, with uh, no hashtag splitting. And uh, even in general, as you can, sorry, and uh, GRU as, as a network. And as you can see, the results in German are less good than the one for Italian and English, because actually the German language is, was uh, harder for us to process, to, to process with no specific processing for German in a sense. So we wanted to do to tackle a general architecture. So we didn't really went into the detail of the German language. And for these reasons, for instance, um, hashtag splitting does not play a role in there, because given the way that German words are built, uh, splitting the hashtag and uh, actually the, the sorry, the, the, the tool that was used to split hashtag was not splitting them in the right way. 
Okay, so that was also uh, that had the negative impact on the on the performance. So um, always in this work, uh, as I said, if you're interested, you can you can read it. We different we 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 run a, a lot of other experiments besides the ones that I showed you. For instance, downsampling the data to see if actually the best performances obtained for English were actually obtained because the data set was bigger than for English and German. So we downsampled uh, the, the, the data of English to be uh, as big as the one for the other two languages to see what happens. And, similar, and similarly, we tested uh, other um, uh, other ablation tests for emoji. Uh, sorry, for, uh, for for uh, for the lexica that were actually used. So, as a as a follow up, let's say of this work, um, we started to think about the application of uh, uh, these uh, these uh, architecture on less resource language. So we said, okay, for this language, for, uh, Italian, German, and English, we do have resources, but what happens for languages for which we do not have this kind of annotated resources? And even for Italian and German that have less resources than, than English, for instance. So we uh, proposed very recently an approach uh, in, in order to adapt cross-lingual model uh, to use training data in English and test on German, Italian, and Spanish in a zero-shot scenario. So here the, the, the idea was to try to apply transfer learning to learn on English and then apply the same task on, uh, the different, uh, on different languages. So um, here the idea was that was to uh, retrain the language model with a modified learning objective, masking emojis when available. And the, the goal was emoji prediction. So in the pre-training phase, the idea, the intuition was that we have emojis that are actually similar in the different languages and that actually convey the same kind of uh, um, sentiment and polarity in the different languages. So as you can see here, so in general, the emoji and the text correlate quite well quite interesting in the different languages, at least in the Indo-European languages. And so this work uh, was actually relying on this uh, intuition. And uh, uh, actually the, the, the standard uh, masked language model was modified so that actually the um, tokens that had to be predicted were actually the emoji and not random tokens. So actually we had two strategies. So for, for the uh, sentences in which no emoji were present uh, in the pre-training phase, it was actually random words that actually had to be predicted according to the standard model, while in the uh, emoji-based masked language model, uh, we had to predict the emojis, but actually, of course, only on sentences in which we did have them. So it's quite of an innovative and uh, recent work. And actually, uh, we, um, we had uh, interesting results. So not super exciting results, but interesting results, because we, um, we, uh, we show, we demonstrated actually using uh, this modified version of uh, masked language model in the training phase could actually uh, improve the results for the different languages. Of course, we do not improve the results with respect to the uh, monolingual setting. So if we have training data for a language and testing data for the same language, that it's much better than actually do this uh, transfer learning. That is actually, I mean, obvious. But still, for less resource language, this actually could be a way to explore and to investigate further. So uh, what is also interesting um, is that when we do all these uh, uh, hate speech detection tasks, we should not focus on words only, but actually offensiveness of taboo words is random of their context, okay? Uh, so a lot of time actually we can find in sentences some swear words, but actually the message is not uh, hate speech per se. Okay, so this also shows the complexity of the task because it does not, it's not enough to have a gazetteer of, uh, of uh, swear words um, to say, okay, this is actually 
a, a message containing hate speech. And um, a lot of time, and actually, uh, the, it's also, the reverse is also true. So a lot of time you have messages that are not, that do not contain any word, any offensive word, but that are actually really offensive. So it could be that it could be some sarcasm, that could be some irony. I mean, it's it's very it's it's really a, a, a complex uh, task. Uh, it's not enough really to say okay, there is a swear word. Okay, that's uh, actually a, a, a hate message. And especially in uh, messages exchanged among uh, young and uh, among uh, friends and so on, a lot of time they use swear words and then they put a smiley actually uh, let's say lowering down the tone of the message so it's it's very it's uh, it's really complex so even in the annotation phase uh, it's really difficult to deliver a data set that is uh, a coherent data set of uh, hate speech messages because even the annotators are somehow biased uh, depending on their cultural background their uh, uh, regional background and so on so uh, it's, it's really important in the, in the annotation phase to, to be able to detect more data, even about the annotation themselves, to be able somehow to uh, make the annotation relative with respect to the uh, annotators themselves. So it's very, it's very complex. So this is the reason why um, ideally we want to go towards having uh, NGO involved in such kind of uh, project and uh, in, the, in these um, data sets creations so that they are used uh, to uh, the task of, um, of uh, hate uh, speech uh, messages because a lot of time they intervene as moderators in social networks. So an alternative approach to the one of collecting those data from social network is actually the one of creating those uh, content was a hateful content uh, from scratch, let's say. So that was also considered and carried out during uh, the CRIP project, in particular uh, by our uh, Italian partners. So the idea here um, was to simulate a scenario to allow data collection and annotation in one step. So all these scenarios were actually created by sociologists and psychologists, so not from computer scientists, but from people that actually are aware and consider in detail all the social interactions and so on. So um, uh, so there the idea, so actually, sorry, uh, two kind of uh, data collections were carried out in schools, always in Trentino, that was actually the um, the use case scenario of the CRIP project. And one, the first one was to collect data that are similar to those shared on social media. So uh, actually, um, we were showing students pictures of different kinds, of really every kind, and they have to say if uh, looking at that image of, for instance, on in Instagram, they would uh, laugh at the person or at the picture. So they would comment in a hateful way to this picture, okay? So, and if yes, which was the reason to laugh at the person or the, the picture? So if it was for the physical, uh, for, um, for, for uh, the way this person was dressing, for the way uh, he was behaving, the expression, the location, the activity, and so on. So we run, especially in Italy, they run a lot of experiments on this, collecting quite a lot of data on the joint, um, on the joint uh, image plus text. Uh, so um, the idea is that what we wanted to do uh, as uh, the, the final part of the CRIP project was to be able to detect jointly um, in text and images, hate speech. Because a lot of time the hate speech is not in words only, but it starts from an image and go then into the comments, or actually an image is used to insult someone. So actually th there is a, still an open issue there. We want to be able to try to understand if there, which is the correlation between uh, images and text for hate speech. So a lot of uh, uh, almost 20,000 images have been uh, collected. And uh, what was uh, uh, the findings uh, about this uh, data collection 
where they have pictures with no human subject are less likely to get a potentially offensive comment. In general, uh, female subjects are most commented and they are most commented on clothing. Why, for instance, male more for facial expression, location, activity, and both for body and pose. And all those data are actually available. And uh, then beside uh, the uh, image uh, annotation, also another kind of simulation was proposed to students. So the idea was to divide a class into groups of five of, uh, sorry, or four or five people uh, to assign roles like the cyberbully, the bullying assistant, the victim assistant, and the victim to the different students, and then assign a plot uh, to reflect upon uh, stereotypes or behaviors. So for instance, uh, one plot, uh, one, one standard plot was like, your shy classmate has a great passion for classical dance. Usually he does not talk much, but today he has decided to invite the class to watch him for his ballet show. And then uh, students were left uh, with this scenario and the role, and they had to start commenting on that. So each of them had to play the role that was assigned to him or to her. And actually this data collection was very, very interesting. So, um, I mean, they were, students were kind of playing for real, but as sociologists and psychologists had shaped the experimental setting according to the different criteria um, that were, uh, and I mean, that were actually respected. That was interesting because they were playing and they did not have any kind of, uh, 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 how to say, uh, impact on their daily lives. So, um, Almost, uh, I mean, eight, uh, more than 8,000 uh, turns were actually annotated with corresponding role. And then uh, different kind of other annotations were carried out on this data. So saying if it was body shame, threat or blackmail, sexism or attacking relatives to try to investigate the different kind of attacks that were done, uh, that were actually uh, done by students. Um, and uh, in terms of this kind of experiments with respect to the other data set that are available and that are crowed by, uh, sorry, from social uh, media, media platform, in this uh, uh, data collection, we do not have religious or, religious, sorry, or uh, uh, racial offenses because it's a different kind of, uh, um, well, it's a different kind of target. Uh, then the exchanges actually were very interesting. I mean, they were kind of real exchanges. So uh, it, it was, how to say, it's, it's not a fake data collection. It's, it's really a real data collection. And we did some uh, um, pilot study also in, in France with uh, another group of students that visited INRIA uh, like one, one year ago. And we had very similar results. So the kind of uh, data that we could obtain are very good. And what is interesting is that the students did not know each other. So actually, it was really a game for them. And uh, they did, how to say, given that they did not want to write really swear words and so on, because it's, it's, it's quite a lot and professors were somewhere there, uh, they used a lot of sarcasm. They, uh, I mean, even in terms of quality of the data that we collected are very challenging because they used a lot of, uh, uh, how to say, um, subtle way to uh, to be hate to, to provide hateful content without being just uh, uh, explicit let's say so that's all for me so thank you a lot for your attention So we are available to uh, answer your questions, uh, if any. It doesn't seem so. Yes, dear all, feel free to ask uh, Serena and uh, Elena your question, either in English or in French, um, maybe through the Q&A uh, or, or the chat. And uh, I would like to thank you very much for sure, Elena and Serena, because it was uh, uh, so 
uh, um, highlighting to see the methodology of uh, your research as uh, uh, academics and the way that you are uh, uh, working as a researcher and the result uh, that your works are provided. So thank you so much for that. Um, so yes, thank you for your thank you, um, for sure. But uh, I wish we could uh, maybe elaborate further with uh, a few questions or if, uh, if you prefer to, to do it uh, afterwards, this works also. Yeah, anyway, we are available to uh, answer all your questions uh, by email if uh, they, uh, they come later. So don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, and if you have also further questions on uh, maybe on, uh, on our papers, uh, we are always uh, available.